Want the same expert advice you get from the pros in the store while shopping online at DiscountTire.com? Meet Treadwell, your personal online tire guide that matches you with the perfect tire for your vehicle. Get your best match in one minute or less with Treadwell by Discount Tire. Save big money on Clearview Cabinetry. Clearview Cabinetry starts as a kitchen built for now and grows with you as life changes. It's flexible by design with full access cabinet construction. So you can go from doors to drawers for storage that works when you need it. Explore Clearview's cabinet options in store and on Menards.com and save big money today. Big buys, big savings. Check out more of our great deals going on now at Menards. Save big money at Menards. You can support this podcast at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoie, and this is Crime Writers On, the podcast about other podcasts and also about true crime, pop culture, journalism. And this week, our take on Monster, the Zodiac Killer. We'll break down and review this true crime follow-up podcast to Atlanta Monster and talk about why, oh why, people can't seem to get enough stories about serial killers. Joining me to get that done and a whole lot more is my real-life husband and true crime co-author, former TV journalist, and the person who sparks a whole lot of joy when I hold him in my hand, Kevin Flint. Hello, Kevin. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> what, what does Marie Kondo. Kondo say like when you throw it out? You say thank you. Thank and you, you for your service. That's what I said to my pepper grinder the other night. <laughs> <laughs> also with us is journalist, true crime author, former defense investigator, licensed private investigator, certified cat lady, and very late Christmas tree chucker, Laura Bricker. Hello, Laura. Hello, yeah. It was time to get the tree out. Um, my neighbor Dan is doing the thing he does where he drives around with a trailer and picks up everybody's Christmas trees when they put them out for curbside pickup because we're going to burn them. Oh, we're he doesn't like big... recycle them or something? He's not making a craft out of them or something? No, we're having a big pyro fire, like a, a tower of Christmas trees. So I was like, I better get my tree out because Dan So he steals the it. refuse everybody leaves at the end of their driveway? It's really funny. So like, I, I was like, he the first year he did it, he did it in a neighborhood, like in the town. We're like right on a town line. And, and I saw somebody at the country store and they were like, wow, I didn't know that the town had signed up for curbside tree pickup this year. That was really nice. And I'm like thinking they didn't. That was my neighbor. Right. <laughs> That's right. He said, so when I'm out in town, if I spot like a good neighborhood, I'll, I'll like, say, hey, Dan, I spotted a bunch of trees in this neighborhood. Hmm. Get on it. The Exeter um, Chamber of Commerce really ought to be paying you, Laura. They really should. I know. Yeah. <laughs> they really should. Or they should be paying the company that actually is supposed to be taking those trees and turning them into mulch, which is what other cities in New Hampshire do. I like the bonfire better. <laughs> a lot of people do bonfires around here. It's That's very true. cathartic. And also, you can throw out all those things that don't bring you joy. You can just chuck them on the bonfire okay that's, right. that's a good that's a good idea thank you log <laughs> thank you for your service <laughs> thank you toby no i'm just kidding, toby. I'm just kidding. <laughs> thank you for your service dura flame <laughs> <laughs> and finally our captain of woke cynicism the author behind the noir novels known as the city trilogy and our patreon exclusive book club host toby ball hello toby bonjour rebecca <laughs> <laughs> well, Toby, you'll be thrilled to hear what we're talking about next week. I'm going to announce that now. We're going to be talking about one of your favorite things. We're going to be talking about the new season of HBO's True Detective, a show that Toby <laughs> hates, uh, even when it was at season one and it was super good. He still didn't like it. Uh-huh. Uh, but we're going to be talking about the new season of True Detective next week. And we're talking about a bunch of other stuff, too. Kevin, we've been watching the first couple episodes. Are uh, you just give me like a temperature take? I taking. have, too. You guys, you on, good? On True Detective? Yeah, you good so yeah, far? Yeah, good. I'm Laura, good so you good far. so far? I, I kind of like it so far. Sorry, Toby. All right, Toby, we don't, don't want to hear what Toby thinks anyway. Um, <laughs> Toby hasn't watched it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I do just want to give a plug to our listeners. If you hear or um, watch something awesome and you think we would be really remiss if we didn't talk about it on this podcast, you can always send us your pitches for stuff to cover. Just send them to crimewriterson at gmail.com. We also have a continuing announcement thread on our Crime Writers On Facebook discussion mm-hmm. group where you can pitch stuff. But sending us emails is always probably the most effective way because Kevin and I both get them. And Kevin responds to them, which all I tr- of them. I try to, yeah. Which 
which is one of the best things about you. Is we that may you not listen to the thing that you say, but we appreciate your effort. And, and, and sometimes Thank we you do for your get, service. I, I would say like 80% of the pitch emails get are things that we've already talked about on the show. But mm-hmm. we still appreciate those pitches. So send them to crimewriterson at gmail.com. Now, uh, speaking of things we got in our mailbox, Kevin. Can you please read this for me? Hate mail. <laughs> we got at crimewriterson at gmail.com a string of, I don't want to say extraordinary, but definitely very strongly worded emails from one listener who I won't name and who I, whose email I will not read verbatim because, you know, if she's listening, which I don't think she is anymore, <laughs> um, I don't want to make her feel bad, but this is a listener who was very very angry about our four thumbs down review of broken hearts Mm -hmm. last episode so angry in fact that the subject line to her email was i know you don't care because you think you are so amazing but dot 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 and then you open the yeah, email. Yeah, with her so far. And it was like dot, 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 rest of the email. Kevin, I have a question for you. All right. Do you think Roger Ebert used to get emails like this? There was no email then. But uh, did he get letters? I don't know. When he gave a movie I mean, a poor review? Well, yeah, probably from the director's mother. I don't know if this is somebody's mother. <laughs> I don't think so. Or other pe- But like from, from viewers that said, you know, uh, I don't know. I probably, I mean, you're not supposed to agree with the reviewer all the time. Right. I mean, the four of us don't agree with each other all the time. That's right. And if somebody, in, like, you know, if you interact with us on Twitter or Facebook and you say, hey, I really liked Someone Knows Something, right? right? Toby likes that podcast. We're not, we've, I don't think we've ever told people, don't do this. Maybe we have in an extreme case. I don't know. I, I sometimes drink while I'm doing this podcast, so I don't remember <laughs> everything. But what we sometimes. say is, just, yeah, we say we're, you know, we're a thumbs down. I wouldn't listen to this, or I, I you know, I, I wouldn't. I, I don't think we've ever said stop or you're stupid for doing this. No, you know, we all have different opinions. I we, think a lot of you enjoy our opinions sometimes, but sometimes we don't. I didn't always agree with Roger Ebert. Right. I mean, I do tell people not to listen to Mike Bodette's podcast because he's a terrible person. I mean, he's, he's, that's the only that's the only line that I have ever crossed. Yeah, but regard. you know, I actually kind of think the podcast isn't that bad. Oh, let's not go there. All right, well, just no point, point. <laughs> just just you know, point in question. But Toby, wouldn't you agree that we would never judge somebody for loving something that we hate? Right. Not out loud. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, I mean, I, I assume part of the reason why people listen to us is so they can disagree with our takes. That's right. Well, I will say that one of the reasons I, I didn't just want to talk about this email so that we could, you know, say that. Mm-hmm. I actually saw a couple of opportunities here to just talk a little bit about how we make the show. because It's something I think that people might be interested in hearing. Because this listener, I would say, and Kevin, you read all of her emails. She I only was, read the first two or three. Well, she was particularly angry with me. Yeah. Right? In yeah. particular. Um, she felt very strongly that I steer you guys into the opinions you have. And she gave an example. She said, you know, uh, quote, she's quoting me. One journalistic issue I have. Ugh. Laura, did you pick up on that? Oh, yes, I did, said Laura. Ugh. Uh, she says, talk about your own sign posting to criticism. Part of a larger point. Um Uh, She thinks that I am basically guiding you guys into saying what you say. And what I wrote back to her is that you all send me notes. Not you, Kevin. I just know how you feel because you tell me in the bathroom when you're brushing your teeth in the morning. But Toby and Laura, you both send me notes when you've watched or listened to something. And then, you know, the questions are kind of framed to give you an opportunity to express your opinion. Laura, do you feel like I sometimes inappropriately push you into an opinion that you didn't already have it's okay if it's yes wait wait, how do you want her to answer that (laughs) all the time yes rebecca that's how i feel um it is kind of a leading question ask fireman ken if it's possible to lead me to say something that i don't want to say if i have my own opinion Mm. um he's been dealing with that yeah he'd be like are you fucking kidding me uh good (laughs) fucking luck right. she's gonna say what she wants to say and and i do and i sometimes try to hold it in in certain situations but in this podcast it's a forum where i can say what i want to say and it's very liberating for me what about you toby do you ever feel pressured to feel or think something when you are recording with kevin and i that you didn't feel or think otherwise uh about true detective <laughs> <laughs> so it was a really good show no i think it's toby, i think it's actually you pick up on that don't, uh, don't you yeah. agree <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I think when we occasionally debrief or whatever, I mean, I think 
we think the shows are better when we have disagreements over stuff. Mm. I think it makes for more of a dynamic. So I, the fact that we are in agreement a lot, when you're asking leading questions, it's generally because I've sent you an email or you've seen a note where I want to comment about something. So you ask me a question about it so I can say something. I want to give a lot of credence to somebody's hate mail. You know, if they write and write and write and write, yeah, they spend their whole evening writing responses to it, it dis- disproportionate to the offense at hand. We get emails quite frequently that are uh, critical. Yeah. And we respond to them. A lot of them are done with respect. Sometimes there's a little bit of snark and edge to it. I mean, that's kind of what we put ourselves up to. Right. But I like to think that we do, you know, this is what our show is. And it's, look, not all the stuff that's out there is, you know, is great. No, some of it sucks. Some of it does suck. Not all of it. (laughs) Not all of it. Don't want to do too broad of a brush. But I think we just got to call them like we see them. Absolutely. You know, do we sometimes get super picky about something like, oh, the music doesn't seem right? Yeah, we do. And maybe you don't care about that, fair listener. Right. Um, But it's a thing that we talk about. And I think that... You know, that uh, it was Madeline Barron who, in complimenting our podcast, said that she thinks that we are teaching people how to listen to podcasts, which I think is very high praise, which we appreciate. And I think that we're the spark notes for people's, (laughs) um, you know, podcast experiences. Yeah, it's not the shortcut, but just like here, you don't have to read stuff. It's the companion analysis to it, which hopefully enhances your enjoyment of you know, the podcast, and if it's something that's a bad podcast and we point it out, hopefully it makes you, you know, more critical of other podcasts and seeing things that's that you like and appreciate things that work. You know, the one thing that was interesting that this listener said was she kind of, one of the reasons she's very angry at me in particular was because she says, you know, I spend time, you know, micro criticizing editing and production and writing. And she's like, we're just here to listen to stuff about crime. And she basically says, you know, um, don't spend your life undermining people's efforts, you know, review it, but then don't spend time saying like, well, if I was going to do it, I would do it like this. Or, you know, she's basically saying like, if you make it sound so easy, you know, just do it, Rebecca. If you think it's so easy, just do it. That's the whole point for me is that we know it's hard. We know it's really hard. And one of the things that I think we do really well on this podcast when we criticize other shows, we do tend to grade a little bit on a scale, which I think that like when I listen back to some shows that we've done, we kind of have like a sense of what the resources are at hand for some of these shows. And I think that one of the reasons why I came, I can't speak for all of you. I mean, I could lead you here, Kevin, but I'm not going to say this is how you feel. Uh-huh. One of the reasons I came down so hard on Broken Hearts is because I know the resources were there. There was a travel budget. There was a network behind it. There was a big magazine company paying for it. You know, editors who ostensibly have a lot of experience writing, you know, for different media were part of it. And it sucked. Uh, If somebody had made that in their basement and it was like an amateur person and I heard it, I may have listened to it with slightly different ear and we would have talked about it framed that way Mm. on the show. I mean, we gave Serial Season 3 a pretty freaking hard time. We set the bar very high. But look, I don't think it's fair to just (laughs) say like this was bad and it didn't work and not try to explain why why, or give an example of how it could have been better. You know, so if you're just going to be mad that we say, oh, I would have done it this way. Well, then I guess we just can't have this conversation. (laughs) And then, you know, then. But if someone is forcing you to listen to this podcast, let us know. We can send help. (laughs) But I I think, I mean, that's just criticism, right? I mean, writing a book is really hard. It's a lot of work. You put your heart and soul into it, you know, and some books suck. And when you critique them, it's sort of almost a given that you respect the effort that people have put into it, unless it's like just something objectionable. I mean, otherwise you just can't critique things. That's right. Like if it's just because somebody worked really hard at it, then you can't really say anything about it. I got a one-star review on Amazon because the guy's book came late. I'm like, that's not (laughs) my fault. I don't work at the post office. Right. Right. I've seen some of those too. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, I I think it's, you know, movies, you know, a hell of a lot of work, a lot of people involved, all this stuff. If you're going to critique them, you, you have to be able to kind of put that aside and, and just hopefully people understand that you understand that. Yeah. But at the same time, 
you know, some are really good and some aren't. That's right. Yeah. That's just how it works. Well, as a criticism uh, podcast, we should be able to accept criticism, too. Absolutely, we Even should. Even if it comes from a batshit crazy cr- place. <laughs> oh, oh, stop it. Oh, Kevin. Stop that's it. I, I like you. No, it's not like him. That was not <laughs> yeah. very respectful. always the I, one who's so reserved but about I, that. But I do have to say, this email had a lot of vitriol behind it. It did. It did. <laughs> but I love you, audience. Audience, I love you, both individually and as a group. But you don't like when people come at your wife. That's a pattern. Pattern that oh, I have detected. Fuck no. Someone comes after my wife. <laughs> Do you want to go to boxing with me, Kevin? <laughs> oh, wow. I could be so get, dangerous. Get ready. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Kevin is like one of the most easygoing people I've ever known in my entire life. But he does have this other side to him I like to call Crazy Kevin. And Crazy oh. Kevin is particularly triggered when people come at the people he loves. That is like oh. the Crazy Kevin. <laughs> yeah. wow. I put the dope in rope a dope. <laughs> All right. Well, moving on, Kevin, I would like to introduce a new segment this week. Can you please read this for me? Toby's Toby's Obscure Obscure Podcast Podcast Corner. (laughs) (laughs) Toby, you still there? I'm still here. All right, you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of recovering from that from that introduction. <laughs> uh, you didn't know that was coming. We just made it I up. Had but... water go up my nose <laughs> <laughs> or wine. Um, you were pitched. It's a miracle. <laughs> it went up water. It came out wine. You were pitched and listened to. Sort of speaking of the, the what we we're just talking about. Sort of getting things from different kinds of places. You were pitched and listened to a podcast project that I believe you also listened to, Kevin. I did, yeah. And you've been asking me if we could just like talk about it on the show really briefly I have not checked it out I'll be honest with you because I've been very very busy trying to just walk so (laughs) can you please tell us what is in your obscure podcast corner this week and why should people check it out I I think this is sort of the opposite of what we were just talking about about you know podcasts that have huge resources and you know a lot of money behind them and probably a cast of thousands working on them So this is a podcast that was uh, pitched to me by one of our listeners. Hopefully she's listening now. It's called Second Read. It started at a, at a, a small, like a local newspaper, and they wanted to make a podcast sort of about what people miss when, when their local newspaper closes. Welcome to Second Read. I'm Brie Kirkham, the digital editor for the Herald Times and Bloomington. In late August 2018, the Hoosier Times newspaper group in southern Indiana eliminated 17 jobs from four newspapers. The day after layoffs were announced, the reporting staff at the Herald Times met to discuss how to continue providing the same level of local news coverage to our readers with fewer resources. And a common thread of the conversation was that it's becoming more and more difficult to prove the value of what we do. Younger audiences don't want to pay for news, and there is a dwindling understanding and respect for why local news matters. What came out of that meeting was this podcast, which seeks to inform potential subscribers on what we do and its value. So the first episode, it's, so it's like 10 or 12 minutes, but it's basically about just covering a story where there is a, a police-involved shooting and there's body camera footage. And it's just basically like there's no like surprise ending or anything. It's just like this thing happens and then you kind of follow uh, the reporters as they they have to overcome a couple of barriers and then actually get the footage and take a look at it and then sort of find out what the story is behind what happened. It's, It's reporters. Like they know what's interesting about the story. They tell the story sort of concisely and logically in an interesting way. I thought it was really good. Yeah, I'll say I, I listened to a rough cut of it, so I, I don't think I, I didn't hear the, the final product, and so I'll, I'll excuse, you know, I'll, I won't talk about you know the technical rough edges that were there, okay? But I thought it was uh, I thought it was very interesting. You're right; it's a short podcast. You know, if you think about something like the Daily, yep, uh, where you basically are using the resources in the newsroom to tell a story. I think it's 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 like that, but instead to of scale to scale, right? Yeah, very much to scale. Um, you're not going to have a million people listen to this podcast, and even though it's you know out there for the whole world, I don't know if you know 
everybody around the country is going to be interested in this local papers podcast. But I hope people in that community are. Right. And I think it's interesting because it, they're talking about how the sausage is made in journalism. In this episode, yeah, it did deal with essentially a, a right to know request and the different things that they had to do and get their lawyer involved and talk with, the, the, I, don't, I can't remember, it was the fire department, the police department, the sheriff, whoever it was, you know, about getting the footage and uh, just trying to make the point that this is what local papers do. That's Without right. local papers, you know, you're just not going to f- get this story and the story behind the story. Local papers and local public radio newsrooms. I'll, I'll put in a plug for that, too. <laughs> yes, you will, Laura, because that's yeah. you, right? Well, I will, because I'm like a huge local community newspaper. I mean, that's like where my passion is with reporting. I've, I've done that for 20 years because, you know, you can look at like big cities. Big cities are always, they have newspapers. They have watchdogs. In little communities and small towns and other areas, that local newspaper is your public watchdog. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, you can sit through some god-awful boring meeting, but if that local reporter is not there, the community might not know about something really important Mm -hmm. going on because that is your one source of information. Mm -hmm. That's the person who sits there and finds out what's going on or follows up on something or, you know, brings to light stories that otherwise might not. I mean, I always call like your community reporters, I used to say like, I compared it to being like an embedded journalist with like the military that's what you're really like when you're working in those in those type of scenarios Mm. because you're part of the community that you work in it's true it's true we have a little local story here in our tiny town oh you're not gonna talk about the are you it's my favorite story no (laughs) and i'm actually gonna bleep out that you said that because it has not been published that that's what it actually is (laughs) we have an interesting story here in our town that I happen to know because I got some tips that there is a story behind the story and I passed the tip along to a local reporter Mm -hmm. and he knows what it is, but he has to really report it out. And he's been doing a series of stories about this thing happening in our town without being able to talk about what he now knows is really going on. But he's not going away. Like he's going to all the meetings. He's asking the questions over and over and he's writing these little items. And I'm like... Good on you, because that's exactly what it's about. Like this is actually important. It is. It's this is like this is where you live. Yeah. And you can talk about you know the Trump Russia investigation being the most important story in America right now. Many of us are more affected by the place that we have to go every day to try to get our business done or pay our taxes or get our trash taken or whatever. Like that actually is where we live. Mm-hmm. Stuff is important, and it's accountability, and it's it's important. All right, so that's called what? Second Read? It's called Second Read. I don't know if it's on iTunes or or stuff yet. You can find it on a website. It's uh, We'll put the link in our show notes, yeah. It's heraldtimesonline.com slash 2ndread. <laughs> you know what? We're just going to put the <laughs> link in our show notes. Get your pen and pencil, people. <laughs> I just did. I just wrote it down. I was going to share it with all my journalism peeps. <laughs> And thus ends the very first edition, and I'm guessing not the last, of (laughs) Toby's Toby's Obscure Obscure Podcast Podcast Corner. Corner. (laughs) I'm going to spin this thing off and make millions. Oh, my God. I feel like I need to come up with something to compete with this. That's such a great title. Yeah, speaking of how the sausage gets made, that's literally how this whole show was built. (laughs) (laughs) On shit we just made up, true crime podcast update, uh, cat of the week. Like, it literally was something that I wrote on a piece of paper and then made Kevin say out loud. And that is how segments are Yeah, born. you guys did that while we were like doing the podcast. <laughs> you didn't have a name at the start. Yeah. Go to Patreon wow. where we'll talk about <laughs> the after show of this show. Yeah, I was sitting there. Rebecca took out a pencil. She asked me for a pencil. I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> Well, I just want to make uh, one big plug for a less obscure podcast. Uh, Kevin, you and I, the episode that we talked obscure about a few weeks ago. Obscure plug. It's, oh, it's no. not. You and I hosted the Netflix podcast, You Can't Make This Up, and we got to interview the um, director of the Netflix documentary, The Innocent Man, Clay Tweel. Yeah. That episode well, is fun. now out. So if people are interested in hearing more about The Innocent Man and how that sausage was made, you can check out the episode from Netflix of You Can't Make This Up. It's their podcast. And... Kevin and I are on it, and it's really fun. We got to host. We did. We Who's got better, to host. is it Director Clay or us? Uh, you are the best person on that podcast. Oh, thank you. Ooh. I definitely let a little too much of my own like asides get in the way, and you just ask direct questions like, what the fuck was up with that guy? <laughs> and I was like, blah, 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 criminal justice, blah, 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 criminal justice, and you just, you were better. You were great. Congratulations. Well, thank you, All right. I'll tune in. <laughs> a star is born. That email's right. I guess you shouldn't be the host of this podcast. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll take it over from here. That script. Well, speaking of, why don't you read the intro right. to our next segment? Moving on. Moving on. Monster. The follow-up to last year's Atlanta Monster looks back 50 years at one of the most notorious serial killers in American history. The Zodiac. Stitched together with archival tape and new interviews, Monster reminds listeners of sinister ciphers and random slayings that gripped California. When you talk to the survivors of victims who've been killed, you get that this is not fun. There's nothing fun about murder. Vallejo police have submitted letters and envelopes from the Zodiac Killer to a private lab to obtain a DNA profile. I enjoy a good tussle, but hey, killing just for the pleasure of it? It's got to be him. And then the lab results would come back and it's an elimination. And that's just a crushing blow. He used to go there even long after he retired and park his car and sit there and think about, what did we miss? Why didn't we catch him? Executive produced by Payne Lindsay, host Matt Frederick carries the show. Though they claim that there is a lot of myth around the Zodiac case, the podcast has yet to correct the record. But with another 10 episodes to go, it's possible they'll put forth a theory which has yet to be made after a half century of investigation. Now, we are going to talk about plot points to Monster. So if you'd like to skip ahead to the spoiler-free reviews, by which time Rebecca will probably have taken over this podcast. <laughs> Maybe. You're doing a really good job. Just look at this, the time code in the show notes. Kevin, you sure you don't want to just keep going? Uh, well, these are all your notes, but I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> there is a listener request to start. There is. You want to read that listener request? Yeah, this is from Susan on Facebook. I would like it not to be a shit on Payne Lindsay hate fest. <laughs> I know people love to dump on him, and I hope and believe you will focus on the merits of this pod. Yeah, we will. Although we will, as a transition, completely shit on the opening lines of this podcast, (laughs) because as our Facebook listener, Melissa, points out, she says she tried to listen. She finds the Zodiac case very interesting. And then she made it into the podcast before she got to where it said, Christmas time, 1968. All was not calm. All was not bright. (laughs) And her question was, how can anyone take writing like this seriously? Now, we are not going to do a shit on Payne Lindsay Fest. So all I'm going to say is, uh, Melissa, you are right. That was a horrible opening to this show. Um, which leads Whoever me to my, wrote it should be a shit. Which leads me to my first uh, question. The construction of this production is very interesting. So we basically have this three-layered podcast. We have the outer layer, where this is associated with uh, Payne Lindsay's production company, Tenderfoot TV. He is sort of does the framework. He comes in and just says something about what we're about to hear at the beginning and then we never hear from him again until he reads a toothbrush ad and then we have the host of the podcast matt frederick who's kind of guy number two and then inside that we have michael butterfield whose research it seems is the foundation of a lot of this who's doing like i think most of the talking in the podcast kevin what do you think of this construction so it's a turducken (laughs) it's a little bit of a turducken yeah yeah well, the construction is kind of, it, it is interesting. It's kind of like the construction with a third love bra. Oh, jeez. Uh, with tagless labels, wow. ultra soft Do fabric. tell, Kevin. <laughs> they, they came at us quickly. Uh, signature half cup sizes and straps that won't slip. Third love is hands down the most comfortable bra you'll own. Yeah. Rebecca, tell us about your third love experience. Just look at my boobs. Oh, my goodness. They great. I love my third love bra. Easy to order, easy to fit. They were totally right about the size I should have gotten. I got that size. I'm very happy with my bra. It's very comfortable. Really like third love. Yeah, they help you identify your breast size and shape. And right. find the right style that fits your body with their Fit Finder quiz. So it's uh, it's way better than having to go to a department store. And just bring 100 bras into the changing room. Have some old, harsh-looking lady. That's not how it works. It doesn't work there anymore. Right now, what you have to do is go, bring like 100 in. You cannot put them back on those stupid hangers. So you leave your dressing room and you feel super guilty when you brought 100 bras in and you're only able to buy one and it's not that great anyway. Right. You can relate to this experience, Laura. It has happened at least once, right? I can. It has, and I will tell you that I had a hard time after I had a child because my size changed, yeah. and then it took a while to get back to what my new normal size was going to be. So this was very helpful to go through their quiz, and they ask you different questions about fit and everything, because everybody has like some one little thing, like you pop out here or there or whatever, and they have a bra for that. They do. They've got these new cotton t-shirt bras and cotton underwear. Ooh. Which was a, a fan favorite, a request that, that people gave. Third Love has been supporting our other podcast, These Are Their Stories, for a million years. That's right. So we're very familiar. A million, yes. 
It's probably the only bra I know anything I could talk about. <laughs> it's true. Because if ladies want one thing, they want to hear Kevin Flynn Man's tell them about bras. bras. Yes. Yeah. But look, at you, you don't have to take my word for it, and I really hope that you wouldn't. But if you don't love the bra, returns and exchanges are free and very easy. Third Love knows there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they're offering a 15% off deal for your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash crime. Crime. Right now and find your perfect fitting bra. That's 15% off your first purchase at thirdlove.com slash crime. Crime. For 15% off today. What else you got, Kevin? Well, you know, you spend a third of your life on your sheets. Mm. So when you're looking for a New Year's resolution, better sleep is a good place to start. And that's why you need the five-star hotel quality sheets known as Brooklinen. Yeah, you do. We all love Brooklinen. We sh- are actually going to end this podcast someday and go work at Brooklinen. <laughs> they work directly with manufacturers and pass those savings on to you. And did you know they have over 20 colors and patterns? I did. I actually troll the Brooklinen website all the time. <laughs> Ever since I found out they have duvet covers and stuff and duvets and pillows, I'm like on there all the time. You know what else they have, Rebecca? What else they have? They have towels. <gasps> they do. What? And I know this because I got them for the women in our house for Christmas. Nice. Shut the front door. I did, and boy, they were big heads. <laughs> How are they? <laughs> no, no, no. Tell us more. How are the towels? I've only been able to sort of caress them uh, <laughs> He's not allowed to use a them. little bit at a time. I haven't actually been able to use them because my wife and daughter have uh, kind of claimed uh-huh. them, but they're very, uh, they're very soft. Uh, they're very plush. I think we got the super. I think I got the super plush for them. But it was a huge hit, and uh, I think the rest of the towels are, are sort of waiting for my use. At, pa- at what Patreon level can we have photos of Toby Ball rubbing a Brooklyn <laughs> towel across his hiney? <laughs> That's a very special, <laughs> exclusive. Level. You could wrap several your, hundred your cat. dollars. Wrap your cat. Yeah, and be a little happier. I would not do that with a towel, with one of those towels. How great does a towel have to be for someone to be psyched to get towels for Christmas? That has I to know. be a great towel. <laughs> no, it, it, they, they are. They, I mean, it's again, it's like it's like going to a really nice hotel, and they have really nice towels, and that's what you have. Yeah, towels, robes, sleep they masks. Have robes? Yeah. Oh my they god. Do. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, sheets, covers. It's all a splash of luxury to your daily routine for 2019. So our Brooklyn and sheets are the best, most comfortable sheets that we've ever slept on. So now it's time for you to get your upgrade. Go to brooklinen.com for an exclusive offer for our listeners. It's $10 off and free shipping when you use promo code CWO, C-W-O. at brooklinen.com. Brooklyn is so confident in their product that all of their sheets, comforters, and towels come with a lifetime warranty, even for Toby Ball's family. Mm. The only way to get $10 off and free shipping is to use promo code CWO at brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com. Promo code CWO. Brooklinen. These really are the best sheets ever. Slow clap for your correct spelling. All right. Okay, Kevin. So back to the traducan. What do you think of the construction of this podcast? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a way, I think it's a strategic way of, you know, adding the Payne Lindsay brand to the podcast, which is, I, I'm not, it's not a shitty thing. I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I, mean, I think that's a smart thing. He's a, we have to acknowledge that he's going to bring Hugely successful yeah, podcaster. Not, it takes nothing away from him to say that. I think it's probably why you have like this three-way production agreement is to get, to, everybody's got to bring something to the table. And I think that, you know, a lot of people are going to give it a listen from the first place because Payne Lindsay is attached to it. So I think it would be kind of crappy if he, you know, is there in the for the, the first thing and you don't ever hear from him again. Granted, he doesn't seem to be doing, contributing a lot to the journalism. He says he's contributing creatively, you know, to the style or, you know, whatever that may mean. But if you never heard from him again, I think a lot of his fans would be like, well, you know, what, what was that all about? Well, it's very transparent. He sets up the first episode mm-hmm. by talking and then saying i'm handing it off to this other person yeah he's there as a framing device like if you had a show that oprah produced Mm -hmm. for a network it would be stupid not to have oprah show up for 10 seconds at the beginning of that show right i get it i get it i get it and i'm willing to just sort of look over it Uh, maybe i got confused about whose voices were whose but doesn't he in the most recent episode doesn't go on a cab ride and he's like no yeah, this no. That's the guy. This is a that's problem I do two. have with the podcast. Uh, their voices are kind of similar. I had, I did a couple times. I was like, "Is this pain?" 
No, this is that guy that he handed off to, but they sound kind of similar. They, they both sound like they're re- they have the same reading rhythm. Honestly, I have yeah. like my my attunement is this. Like I hear this. Their voices are very different, but they both sound like they're reading. And this is a, a criticism I have in the podcast is that the way it's written and the way it's being read does the narration does sound like it's being read. And that is something that Payne Lindsay does. And that is something that Matt Frederick also does. So he's the guy who goes on the cab ride and then ends up in that neighborhood. Yes. Mm-hmm. You're kidding. The only time we're no, hearing this is Payne, actually the problem that I that I yeah. have. If I have one problem and they have started they started to really correct this in episode five. But it's that you never reintroduce or reorient the listeners as to who is speaking. Yeah. And you introduce somebody and then we're just supposed to know, recognize their voice, and you add another voice. They probably assume, okay, we've already introduced this guy, so we don't have to do it again or do it over and over again. But remember, we can't see the person. We're not reading their name. You know, it's it's there. You you really do need to kind of step in and keep reminding people not only who this is, but sort of contextually who they are. You know, just don't throw in the guy's name. You got to remember every episode that this is the guy with the. The Zodiac Killer, Michael Butterfield. Yeah, with with the you know the website. So ZodiacKillerFact dot com. Is that what it is? The most like yeah. literally yeah. named hilarious. Yeah. But by the way, I went on that today. There's a lot of shit there. Yeah, and that's not a style thing. It's it's exactly for the reason that Toby's saying he ended up getting lost. I ended up getting lost quite a bit. Is who's speaking and why this is important? Yeah, and why do you? Same how do here. you know this? You know. And then what he said was like seemed very Payne Lindsay ish. All right. Well, uh, construction uh, question number two. I'm just going to lead you guys to where I want you to go on this. Okay, shall I? Um, Tell me what to say, Rebecca. I don't actually think this is an investigative podcast, at least not yet. So far to me, it's a documentary podcast. This isn't a uh, what happened. It is a this is what happened podcast, at least so far. The field tape and new stuff we're getting is basically sightseeing. The guys, they go to see the site where... The murders happened. They go and and maybe they're recording some interviews while they're at those places. We don't actually hear them in those interviews interacting with people. But it really is a very detailed telling about what happened in this case. And as some of our listeners have pointed out, this did happen in like 1968, 1969, 1970. People, if they didn't see the David Fincher film, which was a stylized version of the story, not a documentary, they may not know a lot about this case. And is this just a documentary so far? Laura, what do you think? So far, it really is. And, you know, and I don't know where it's going. So maybe this is like the setup. We're giving you like the case to date. And then maybe we're going to segue into some new leads or where things are going now. Um, but I mean, this is not a case that I have been super, you know, up to speed on. So, you know, it was interesting for me to kind of listen to this, you know, what happened and how it happened and where it happened. And, and so it really was. It was really like one of those like, you know, the shows that you you watch on TV that like the docudramas that recreate everything that happened. Um, you know, we had the voiceover guy reading the Zodiac letters when the newspapers got them with the super Stranger Things music in the background, <laughs> which kind of grew on me. I have to say it was like oddly soothing as I was listening to it. Dong, 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 dong. <laughs> Dear editor, this is the murderer of the two teenagers last Christmas at Lake Herman and the girl on the 4th of July near the golf course in Vallejo. Here is part of a cipher. The other two parts of this cipher are being mailed to the editors of the Vallejo Times and San Francisco Examiner. I want you to print this cipher on the front page of your paper. In this cipher is my identity. If you do not print this by the afternoon of Friday, 1st of August, I will go on a kill rampage Friday night. I will cruise around all weekend killing lone people in the night, then move on to kill again. I don't hate this. Um, I actually don't. This is actually, I think, pretty well done for what it is, if that's what the goal is, is to take a case, report what's happened. I mean, the only thing I didn't necessarily love so far is like there was sort of like a generic serial killer expert. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Like everybody already knows that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was just kind of like, to me, kind of like filler put in there. But I mean, they do have some interesting people they're talking to, the police officers, the newspaper people. Um, Really interesting, I thought, to hear you know, when you're thinking about when this happened and how the police response was at the time and how, you know, what they had available to them for investigative resources and technology at the time, which was very different, which was interesting. The sourcing is amazing, Kevin. We have cops. 
Mm-hmm. We have like the cop who actually showed up on the scene for one of the killings. Yep. We've got like the photographer who shot the first victim. We have uh, victims, uh, relatives of the victims, a really first person sourcing. And I mean, you know, we talked last week and we've talked about this before with other podcasts, but about broken hearts in particular, like what is the purpose of this? I've seen some criticism on our Facebook page saying like, what is the purpose of this? What are they doing that's new? I think what they're doing is making, at least so far, the first five episodes, a documentary about the Zodiac Killer telling us what happened. And as far as documentaries go, the sourcing is pretty impeccable. Yeah, I did a a book about something that happened 50 years earlier, and it was very hard to find real people, live people, who had, you know, certain knowledge of the, the, uh, you know, the subject. Zodiac Killer is different because you had a lot of different people that uh, had bits and pieces of the story and, you know, are, are a lot easier to find. But, you know, I, I mean, credit to, like, digging in. And certainly it sounds like that our friend Mr. Butterfield. They're recreating his work in audio form, right? That's what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. He's helping them source this. He, yeah, he's the, and this the is primary my source is, in a lot of great things. I, I, when I listen to this, I keep thinking, like, and I don't think this often, like, do we need a host here? Well, we need somebody to let you know who's talking, right? Because I think we've demonstrated that's a bad right, but like a frontline style thing where that just indicates that yeah. it's almost like great tape. The interstitials being Butterfield's like, I see, ex- yeah. explanation. I see what you're saying. If you're doing a, a straight documentary podcast, which is cool, and if that's the way it's going to go, and that's what it would be, then I think that that would be fine. I suspect that the next, at some point, in the next two thirds of this run that we're going to start getting theories thrown out as to who people are and different things that is sort of where the true heart of this podcast may be going. Maybe. And that's just a complete supposition, so I'm not going to, you know. You're not going to criticize it based on that. For sins that I think it's going to make, but hasn't made. Right. So, I mean, the choice of host is telling. He has a podcast about conspiracy theories. Right. So I'm like, well, why, why would you select him unless... Well, he's part of the brand too, though. He's part of the How Stuff Works brand. I think it's not unreasonable to draw that inference that if your conspiracy theory guy is going to be hosting the podcast about who the the Zodiac Killer was, there might be some some talk about the real story is not the real story. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, Toby, you know, I I know that you like like me, but you like sometimes even like things that are drier than even I like them to be. But I also know mm-hmm. that you don't love serial killers. <laughs> oh, who um, loves serial killers? You actually killers? admitted that right before we started taping this podcast and we started talking about, potentially talking about that Ted Bundy thing that's coming out. You were like, oh, I hate serial killers. I'm curious to know if you have that question of whether or not there's value in a podcast that is just basically at this point telling the story of the Zodiac Killer. What do you think? Uh, I mean, I think it's, you know, I think it's fine, but I think it keeps it from being like a great podcast. Like it's not bad. Like uh, like you're saying, like it's got it's got a lot of good tape. Uh, they talk to a lot of interesting people. Uh, who knows where it's going? So I guess that's fine. But there is sort of like, what's the point? And, and in some ways, I think maybe given the past, like maybe not having a point is is good mm. because like the Atlanta Monster was like trying to have a point, and it that just made it awful. Mm. So maybe just telling the story in a sort of straightforward, no take on it manner is better in this case. I, it's 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 odd, you know, because I think that part of it it's it's good, and there's these weird moments where they try and I think get the host who I thought was Payne Lindsay, but is in fact this other guy, a little more involved, like just by going to places. Right. And it's just, it always seems like such bullshit to yeah. me because it's like, oh, you know, we went to the place where that couple was killed by that beautiful lake. And why would anybody kill somebody in a place that was so beautiful? And look, there's another couple. So I can't believe it, but there's actually a couple down by the shore yeah. on the actual island. And they're the only people we see here. I mean, you can't even make this stuff up. I think we should go down and talk to them. Just like that first couple, and let's go over and talk to them. Oh, and it turns out they were, they're into the zodiac. <laughs> yeah, they were dark tourists. And this is where they come yeah, to hang out. They were out. dark touristing. And then I'm going to take a cab ride, and the guy's got the same name as the original cab driver. And then I showed up in this neighborhood, 
<laughs> and and there was a guy whose dad had seen the whole thing happen. I actually that was pretty like, good. You... Piece of, I think that was that was that was fun. more I worthwhile than thing. going to the lake. <laughs> yeah, and taking us along. Like, We're going was... to the turn off for no reason. Yeah, yeah. The, the whole the whole setup was bizarre though because he's like he makes this good point about like you know it got me thinking like why had his mo changed? It went from like couples in secluded areas to wearing that costume to now he's like killing a taxi driver so you know to try and figure it out i decided to take the same taxi ride i'm like what the <laughs> fuck does that have to do with that that has nothing that is that's gonna to, give you zero insight it. yeah they were trying to crab oh crib it there are definitely like podcast tropes and when this podcast tries to follow those tropes i would say just I enjoy the parts that are straight documentary. I really do. I'm enjoying yeah. those parts. And I actually appreciate, I think this podcast has made some very good ethical decisions driven by, I think, Michael Butterfield, who is the one at the beginning of the podcast who basically said, like, people think they know things, but they don't. He's like, I know the more about this than anybody else. But even I will say, like, I don't know because I don't. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the guiding principles of the podcast. He lays it out right up front. And the other thing he does, which I really like, is that there's that one victim who was the waitress who was shot in the car with a guy she picked up. And they the podcast talks to her husband, which was a great get. I mean, I'm sure he's given a ton of interviews, but it was a great get. And Michael Butterfield, again, is sort of like the the ethical heart of this podcast, comes in and says, like, there's a lot of rumors about her. But we don't know if they're true. Like, we can't say that she had tons of boyfriends. Like, we don't know. People want it to be that because it makes for a better story. But, like, we don't know that's what it was. And I'm like, it was a good choice to leave that in because it would be so tempting to be like, didn't she kind of have it coming a little bit? Which has been mm -hmm. some of the story around her death. I've I've seen accounts that sort of say that. So. Mm -hmm. I, I do think, and also they use the word comprises correctly in this podcast, which I appreciate. Um, <laughs> side note. But I see a lot of potential there and the drier stuff that the really the Butterfield heavy stuff. And when, um, you know, they're using our narrator number two, Matt Frederick, just to be interstitial stitching together stuff. I actually really like those parts. I think that they're they're well done and they're good. So look, can we just talk about the case? Because the case is super interesting, even though Toby hates serial yeah. killers. One of the things that's the thing that marks this case are the ciphers, the thing that the Zodiac killer wants to be known. Mm -hmm. Kevin, we hear that very interesting, you know, sort of scene in the newspaper and they sort of have this like Pentagon paper set up where the papers all have to coordinate and decide if they're going to print these ciphers. What do you think of the decision by the newspapers at the time to print the Zodiac killer ciphers? Well, I th think it was probably a, the right thing to do at the time. Um, you know, remember there was a whole thing about the uh, Unabomber and his manifesto. That's and, right. Uh, you know, I don't think it happens very often, but I, I don't think there was a lot of precedent back then for for what to do. And I don't think any newspaper editor wants to feel like, well, if you went out and shot somebody because you didn't run this, you know, like, can you defend that decision? It, it's there's no, not a really good answer. They either all had to not do it or they all had to do it. They yeah. couldn't like one couldn't. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah. But, but, you know, and I think you could find, you know, what is the result of that? So, well, then he certainly felt like. He had an ear at the San Francisco Chronicle mm. and that he also could kind of play the San Francisco Chronicle. Right. Now, Laura, I know that you and Ken have a really good relationship. I, if you and Byron <laughs> Ken. <laughs> yes. Uh-oh. Where is this yeah. going? Uh-oh. Do you think <laughs> that it is super romantic to sit together with your husband to solve serial killer ciphers that have been printed in the newspaper. Is that an activity that you guys would do together? Well, I might want to do it, but I don't think he would ever want to do it. Yeah, that's a little weird. Um, but you know what? It's interesting. I mean, it's it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, <laughs> and that took a lot of dedication. So you know what? They were having a lot of quality time together. Yeah. It took them a day. <laughs> they're good at puzzles, Toby. I couldn't believe that they were like, you know, they had cryptanalysts and Cryptographers, you know, yes. police and stuff. I'm like, what are you talking about? And then they did, they they tell how they did it, and it's like stuff that like I feel like I knew in like seventh grade. <laughs> it's like, well, E is the most frequent letter, and then you like plug it in and see if you can figure out. A it was weird. Hmm. Like I don't doubt that it was true, but I'm like, how did this? The techniques to get to the solution didn't seem like they were that hard. Yeah. That they would like flummox people, and it would take like a couple in their living room. 
neglecting their daughter to <laughs> finally break it uh, is, is odd. Now, Toby, what do you think of, you know, sort of the character and the myth of the Zodiac? I mean, I mean, aside from the ciphers, and I heard you groaning when I mentioned the ciphers earlier, but another weird thing that the Zodiac did was like show up in a costume yeah. uh, to murder people, which as, <laughs> as they point out in the podcast, because it could only be for the people he's about to murder, right? Because he thinks he's going to kill them. He made phone calls to the police to tell them he had just murdered people. What do you think about that? So I disagree in that. I think it might have been just for himself. Like yeah. I think dressing up like that doesn't necessarily have to be for an external audience. Mm-hmm. I think that might just be like sort of fantasy fulfillment or whatever. That's like the scariest scene in the Fincher film, right? right? Yep. I remember it very, very clearly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's – there's no other reason why you would have a podcast about it at this point, right? Is that there's a lot going on with this this guy. You know, I guess they get that guy who uh, literally wrote the book on serial killers <laughs> to talk about. Laura's favorite expert. <laughs> p- about paras, you know, and uh, – you know, I kind of blame the Zodiac for creating this myth of the, you know, genius serial killer who likes to taunt the detectives, which has spawned like so many shitty novels. Mm. That's the interesting thing. Otherwise, you know, in addition to that, he's just another sort of lurid, sadistic mass murderer. Yeah. You know, it's it's not there's nothing romantic about him or anything like that. It's just he he happened to have this aspect of his personality that was sort of more performative. Now, Kevin, Laura said she didn't enjoy the serial killer expert part. I didn't think it was terrible. I mean, I think it is good to at least, in, instead yeah. of the host just saying things that he's also heard in Silence of the Lambs, like actually going to the person who <laughs> has written a book about it and who can explain. I mean, to me, that added at least, you know, for the eight people who had never watched Silence of the Lambs or whatever to get some of that serial killer context. But like the Zodiac story, the serial killer story, like the Zodiac, as Toby said, spawned a lot of fiction about the genius serial killer. Is that what attracts us to the serial killer stories? Because of ones like this where a guy put on a costume, changes his M.O., you know, uh, puts letters in the newspaper, calls the cops, is playing a game. Yeah, see, I I mean, I, I don't consider the Zodiac to be a serial killer in the sense, you know, in the sort of categories of a a Ted Bundy or a, a Son of Sam or uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, I, I see him more as a uh, kind of a spree killer or a personal cause killer. Uh, he killed multiple times, but it's a completely different animal, I think, than your, uh, for lack of a better term, run-of-the-mill serial killer. And, you know, the more I think about it, it just really seems odd that the way the M.O., changed and how some say yeah. well it evolved and that does happen is one of the theories going to be no we actually are looking at two people or a copycat that picked up the banner and then claimed to be zodiac or something like that because it really does seem like the whatever satisfaction the killer got from the first killing and the last killing seemed to be really different Hmm. There were actually, I was interested to find out when I was just doing a little reading on this, two copycats of the Zodiac. There was the New York City Zodiac copycat and also a Japanese Zodiac copycat. Really? So I just want to pick up on one thing that Toby mentioned earlier, which was the David Fincher film. Kevin, you've seen Zodiac? Yeah, it was a while ago, yeah. Did you like it? Do you think it was good? I thought it was okay. I'm trying to remember. I mean, it wasn't like one of my favorites. I do remember who the guy they thought was. It was Drew Carey's brother. <laughs> We've seen it in a bunch of stuff. I'm just going to say- And his say, watch had yeah. the- uh, I, I am yeah. a huge David Fincher fan, as yeah. you know. I think David Fincher is a genius. Uh-huh. I loved Zodiac. I will never watch it again, because I remember just being completely scared shitless the entire time. Uh-huh. And Mark Ruffalo plays the hero cop they talk about in this podcast, yep. the cop that all the other characters uh-huh. are sort of modeled after, which is super interesting. This is sort of the era where a cop could be famous for working on a case. That's like uh-huh. not something that exists anymore. Jake Gyllenhaal was in Zodiac, and of course, uh, Robert Downey Jr. plays journalist in uh, Zodiac. But Toby, I'm just curious to know like, if people... like want to see that movie it sounds like you've seen it more recently than me would you recommend it the david fincher version of zodiac it's it's super creepy (laughs) like i don't usually get like really creeped out by movies you know some of the scenes are pretty intense i thought it was really good now i bring it up because michael butterfield our expert in this podcast if you go to the 
either awesome or horribly named, depending on how you decide, uh, ZodiacKillerFact.com, which I would recommend to our listeners if they are interested in this case because of this podcast or they are interested in it before. Like That website has everything, everything you could possibly want to know about the case. But Michael Butterfield was a consultant on Zodiac. Michael Butterfield has been a consultant on pretty much every Zodiac media project that has ever been made. Like he Maybe is, he's the Zodiac. Uh, uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm not, no, he, he's not old enough it's, to be a Zodiac. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I, you know, I, I don't want to like get too far into speculation territory, but I think, you know, when, you know, when I first read Michelle McNamara's book about the Golden State Killer and they sort of talk about their theories around him, was he a cop, was he a pilot, was this or that? When I hear what the Zodiac Killer said, it's very easy in your mind to sort of develop ideas around what kind of person it might be. And these crimes happen a very long time ago. So I think there's a very excellent chance Zodiac Killer is dead. Am I alone in thinking that? Yeah, well, no, probably. I think it's pretty, yeah. well, when 69, well, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. He could still be alive, Rebecca. I mean, it's late 60s, early 70s. Um, yeah, he could still be alive. He could be anywhere. Well, I, I'll t- yeah, stop it. I mean, it's like my parents' age. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the one thing that always sticks out to me whenever I hear that tape of him calling the cops is that he refers to the couple in the car as kids. He refers to people he's killed as kids. Mm-hmm. And he actually killed people who were like 20. Mm-hmm. And I always think the Zodiac Killer, with his knowledge of doing these ciphers, may have been older, may have been like a war veteran or something. Anyone else have a theory about the Zodiac Killer they want to throw out? You're going to blame it on the vets? <laughs> Is that what's going on? Becca, that's the greatest generation. <laughs> Paging Tom Brokaw. Right. And I don't think like in other, with other serial killers, which the thing was about the killing, it seems like his real desire here is to have the notor- notoriety and power, mm. which is, you know, kind of the opposite of what most serial killers get. And so it's that's what makes it a unique story. I mean, even if that were to happen today, it would it would just sets itself apart from like other criminals that I think it would always sort of have a, a special place in the the dark heart of America. The best moment of the podcast to me is when that police chief is like he has all the appearance of a maniac or something. Like, <laughs> really? Because he dresses no up shit. in a costume and kills people? <laughs> Lunatic. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's a maniac. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Can't fool you, copper. <laughs> Well, let's do that thing we do. We are five episodes in to what uh, promises to be a 15-episode series of Monster, the Zodiac Killer. I would love to get all of your thumbs up or thumbs down reviews at this point in the series. Would you recommend that people check out this podcast? I know it's hard, Laura Bricker, but I'm going to start with you. What do you think? Oh, God, I'm always the first out of the gate. You know, I, I'm going to give it a thumbs up because I think it was well done. I think it was interesting. I think they had interesting sources. And that synthesizer music was actually very cathartic to listen to while I was rage walking along in the freezing cold weather and my ass was freezing off because it was so cold and the ice was cracking but I was like dung, 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 dung. I was like I'm warm so no it's, it's interesting and you know it's a, it's a documentary it's not at this point an investigative podcast but it's got you know a pretty good overview of the case and they've got really good sources Laura I will tell you every single time I hear that synthesizer music come in <laughs> All I can hear is you going dong, 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 dong. I mean, that is like the, that is the replacement for the music in my head. And I will tell you, um, I think that the mistake that I make in my brain is associating that music with the Atlanta Monster series, which just took place in the 80s. And what I've decided to do yeah. is just decide this is this podcast's music, the show Monster, yeah. this larger brand they've created. Mm-hmm. And I also have gotten used to it, even though it doesn't fit mm-hmm. the time of the podcast, whatever. But all I just want to yeah. you know, all I can hear is... <laughs> you can hear my dun, voice. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Laura Bricker's uh, That's, interpretation. Uh-huh. It's all I can hear all the time, too, while walking around all day long, because now it's like burned in my brain <laughs> all right so toby ball i'm coming to you now monster the zodiac killer thumbs up or thumbs down toby ball which do you choose dong dunk dunk dong <laughs> well, first, dunk. when i do my true crime <laughs> yes. documentary my background music is going to be lar going dong let's just put that on loop um Again, I I think it's a it's a little bit of a tough call for me. Like I I give it a thumbs up, not like a big thumbs up, but a thumbs up. Like everybody's been saying, it's got it's got good tape. I think they do a pretty good job of of sequencing and keeping the story pretty clear. 
I was trying to figure out like what is it that there, it seemed like there was something lacking from it, and I was just trying to think about what the podcasts that we think are really really good have, and I think it's more you know I I think like like Madeline Barron and and Amber Hunt and Connie Walker. And, you know, Bikram and, and you mean believe, podcast like, hosted by women. Is that every single podcast you just name is hosted and produced by women? Yes. Yeah, so it's the chicks. <laughs> they don't, doesn't have any chicks. <laughs> no, I was going to say Bill Rankin is another one. There's sort of like a more there's it's like a moral seriousness about it. Not that it's preachy or, or anything like that, but that I think there's uh, an attempt to sort of confront the issues in a somewhat more serious way than like what could be worse than killing a child you know, that kind of stuff that just seems like it's, it's, it's kind of missing, but as far as just telling a story, clearly, I I think this does a, it does a fine job and there's, you know, there is some buffoonery, but it's pretty much few and far between. So a few quibbles. One is the bro-ness of the podcast that to me, that sound really is set up uh, with that Payne Lindsay tape at the beginning. And even if I didn't have an issue just with him and his sort of style and like mediocrity, I don't like the way the episodes are set up. I understand why they did it. They want to infuse his brand. They probably are contractually obligated to do so. But what they have him say is dumb. If it were me, I would try to figure out a way to make it smarter or just change what they're doing there. I also have an issue with the production style of How Stuff Works podcast in general. They're not the only company that does this. They over filter their field audio to reduce background noise to a degree, and they over filter even the host, uh, Matt Frederick's narration audio to reduce, I'm, I'm guessing to reduce background noise to a degree where the audio has an artificial sound to it. So much so that when you go to real field tape, where you're talking about people in the field, it's a very um, audio jarring contrast to me as a listener. Like it's almost like processed food, this podcast in some ways, when you hear people talk. So I don't love that. A third thing is that I have figured out, I figured this out in episode four, this podcast, each episode is almost exactly 30 minutes long and there's almost exactly 22 minutes of real content and the rest of it is ads and then padding, coming up on and then coming up next on. That is the exact format of a 30 minute television show, right? 22 minutes of content with commercials and padding. So all that being said, I'm going to give this podcast a thumbs up. And here's why. What? <laughs> if you are interested in listening to what is essentially a half hour TV show version that is a documentary of what happened in this case, if you care about the case uh, and you already know about it, you're not going to care. You're not going to like it. If you care about all those stylistic things, you're not going to like it. I think this case is interesting. I think the Zodiac Killer case, it's a hallmark American crime story. It's a lot here. Michael Butterfield's work is super interesting. Yeah, if I redid this whole thing, I would just put him at the center of it and strip away the sort of host stuff and maybe do some interstitial talking without the sort of need to have a quote unquote host. But I've learned a lot. And I think that the sourcing of this and just the number of interviews they have and people they talk to, they're well edited interviews. They don't go too long. Super interesting. It's like watching a tightly produced half hour television series documentary about the Zodiac Killer. I can't say that it's bad for what for what it is. And if it's that, it's thumbs up for me. If you go into it expecting more than that, thumbs down. So overall, because that's it's exceeded my expectations because I'm enjoying what I'm hearing, I give it a thumbs up. What about you, Kevin? I feel like um, that I was you know, asked to watch the first 10 minutes of Malcolm X. Mm. And I'm saying, yeah, it's a great musical. They had Denzel Washington in a zoot suit. It had this great number. <laughs> do you remember that opening <laughs> I do. scene? I do. You know? And uh, like, oh, that's not what the movie's about. So I'm going to give it a thumbs up. I think these five episodes get consecutively better. Mm. And he said, you know, where it had, I think, some problems in the first two, you know, setup problems uh, in the first couple of episodes, you can hear them correcting them as they go along. It's getting stronger. But, you know, I'm sort of uneasy about where the next 10 episodes go. Right. And it's just it's very conspicuous that there's that amount of space left. <laughs> <laughs> and where it might go. They could have just sold that, that many ads. I mean, Kevin, yeah. there's literally six well, minutes of podcast between every ad. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> the Zodiac didn't have 70 victims, you know? So I'm just wondering, and I, like I said, it's not fair to criticize it for a sin it has yet to commit. Right. So I would say I'm a thumbs up now. Um, if after episode 10 and 12, there's like crazy conspiracy theories or wild accusations, 
I bet say, oh, this is actually a thumbs down. Or if there's like some really smart investigative stuff that's really kind of thought provoking. They solve it. If they solve it, right? <laughs> then it's like two big thumbs up. But I'll just say it was good. Although, yeah, I don't think we've heard what the actual podcast is yet. I think that it's been good so far. They they've done a good job of putting it together. And whenever they play that music, I just want to go out and rage walk with Laura while she's wearing her Rothy shoes. Yeah, you do. Rothy's are the stylish, classic, comfortable shoe. It comes in four fashionable styles for women and girls. They have the flat, the point. The loafer and the sneaker, they're good enough for a princess. And Laura Bricker? <laughs> and me. That's, that's me. Well, no, Meghan Markle uh, was seen wearing her Rothy's. Oh, was she On really? a, wow. an Australian tour with Prince Harry. That's right. Yeah, and the major added bonus, they're machine washable. That's right. So, like, you know, when Laura's out there and her feet are getting really hot and sweaty <laughs> because she's working up <laughs> such an anger, mm-hmm. be able to just peel those guys off. Throw them right in the washing machine. Why not? I mean, they're made from recycled plastic water bottles. Yeah. So, you know, they're durable. Yeah. No, I love the Rothy's and I love that, you know, they come in different styles. I have the regular traditional like rounded point ones, but I like all the colors they come in and that, you know, you can kind of dress them up or dress them down. And it's it's almost like wearing slippers. They're so comfortable. Right now, Rothy's has an amazing deal for our listeners if you use code CRIME Crime. to get free shipping with no minimum. Plus, you'll get free shipping and free returns or exchanges on your Rothy's shoe. So go to Rothy's, R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com and enter code CRIME Crime. to get your new favorite flats and free shipping. It's a no-brainer. Shoes that are comfortable, stylish, and sustainable and free shipping. Go get yourself a pair today, rothys.com, promo code CRIME. Crime. Get this deal while it lasts. What else you got, Kevin? Well, this is from our friends over at Stitcher. If you're a parent thinking about becoming one, or you just want to laugh at two people trying to succeed at parenthood, here's a new podcast for you. Ready? Yes. It's called Josie and Johnny are having a baby with you. Oh, uh, with us? Well, I mean, I guess with all of us. Okay. Uh, jo- oh. Josie Long and Johnny Donnie, who are two hilarious, clueless comedians who are just learning as they go. The show follows Josie and Johnny through their not totally planned pregnancy mm. as they try to prepare for the for the birth of their first child. Okay, let's just get real. Round the horn, uh, four of us. Your first child, who was planned? Who was an accident? I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I only have one child, so um, yeah. And he was he was planned, and it only took one month. So don't believe what they tell Fantastic. you, ladies. About those, Same here. Uh, how long? Yeah, Rebecca, I know you were planned. <laughs> Pull the goalie I, immediately. <laughs> my guy was pl- Toby. Can you can you spill? Planned and planned. Planned and planned. Only no one surprise on this panel, then, huh? Really? Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, no. No, he wasn't a surprise. No, it just happened sooner than we thought it would. Isn't that kind of a surprise? No. Okay, well, back to Josie and Johnny. (laughs) In each episode, they sit down with actors, writers, and entertainers who are also parents to help them figure things out. People like John Hodgman, Jane Marie, Eugene Miram, and Rachel Sklar. They cover the funnier, messier questions from, what is no sleep really like, Mm. to, are we allowed to politically indoctrinate kids? Mm. I think your own yes. kids, the answer is yes. <laughs> the neighbor's kids, probably not. Uh, they do talk about the tougher stuff, too, like going through IVF, postpartum depression, and other mental health issues that come up as expecting parents. Well, because we're too old to do that podcast, yep. we're going to leave it to Josie and Johnny. You have to go check out their podcast to hear more. It's Josie and Johnny are having a baby with you. You. It's in your podcast app right now, and you can hear the first episode. Now it's time for my favorite part of this podcast, a little something I like to call the crime Crime of of the week. week. (laughs) Mystery solved in Oklahoma City. Police had been looking for the man who took a prominent piece of art from the 21C Museum Hotel. The unidentified man waddled away with a four foot tall purple penguin. Surveillance video shows the suspect carrying the elliptical shaped bird by the head. The $3,000 statue is a feature of the museum hotel chain. Hotels in different cities have penguins of a different color. After disappearing on Sunday, the culprit returned the purple penguin on Friday unharmed and undamaged, and no arrests have been made. Panel, this is my question for you. 
This thief and his purple penguin enjoyed a whole week together. What did they do? Laura Bricker, what do you think? They went to Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I have to say, when I saw this story, I loved it because it reminded me of near where we live, there's a town where there's this place that has fantasy booths. And I won't get into that. You can look it up and find out what happens in the fantasy booths. I learned about the fantasy booths my first day at the newspaper as an intern because somebody had written a letter to the editor complaining about the unsanitary conditions there. And I'm like, oh, what the hell do you think's happening? Oh my but God. The, the owner, the owner got busted down in like Key West or something because he had stolen a mermaid statue while he was on vacation. Nice. So Did I he drill like, a hole in it? Ew. So anyway, um, I really, I really loved this because it brought back good old fun memories of the newspaper. <laughs> All right. So Toby Ball, this guy had a week with his purple penguin. What do you think they did together? You know, I watched March of the Penguins. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they don't, the penguins don't really do a hell, hell of a lot. Yeah. <laughs> they march. They, they huddle up for warmth mm-hmm. and then the male sits on the eggs. Yeah. So I don't know, man. Maybe he sat. Maybe the guy sat on that penguin's egg. Maybe they huddled together. I don't have an. I don't have an answer to this question. I didn't even know what was coming. <laughs> Kevin Flynn, what do you think this guy did with his penguin for a week? I think the purple penguin found a pink penguin mm-hmm. and said, "That's how you make a magenta penguin." Oh. I oh. think they both went to the White House and had a Big Mac. That's my opinion about what they did for oh. the week. <laughs> All right. We should, political humor. we should probably <laughs> end it on that note. Laura Bricker, before we sign off for the week, do we have a cat of the week this week? We don't. I had a cat lined up and I was so excited. And then the greatest thing ever appeared in our Crime Writers on discussion group. What's that? Rachel Baker. Her nomination for Cat Ahem Alpaca of the Week. This is Carlos, who lives with his pal Pedro in our field. <laughs> He is the most <laughs> he has his little alpaca, and he has his little hair over his eyes. Mm-hmm. And she As says his most ridiculous feature is that when they have their annual haircut, they no longer recognize each other, <laughs> <laughs> despite oh watching each other have said haircut. <laughs> panic that there's a new alpaca in town and have to have a fight. Wow, <laughs> mm. that is an excellent submission for cat slash dog slash alpaca of the week. Laura Bricker, if people want to reach out to you personally, perhaps on Twitter to pitch, they're super weird animals who don't recognize each other when they have haircuts, whether they be cats, dogs, <laughs> alpacas, llamas, <laughs> penguins, yaks. How can they find you on Twitter? At Laura Bricker. And Tony Ball, if folks want to reach out to you and give you praise for purchasing a grand set of Brooklyn and towels for your wife and daughter <laughs> for Christmas, how can they find you online? They can find me at Toby Ball NH, I after this I'm gonna have to go and break it to Hunter that he did not get cat of the week. <laughs> he was he was so in the running. He was like, and then I was like, I'm sorry, but the alpaca <laughs> takes it. Yeah, like if I could shave Olaf and then have Hunter not recognize him, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and Kevin Flynn, if people want to reach out to you and tell you that they wished you had just continued hosting the podcast when you took those papers from my hand and then I took them back, how can they find you online? I am at Kevin P Flynn. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you. Can can find me at Reb Lavoy. You can also send us hate mail at crimewriterson at gmail.com or you can follow the show on Twitter at crimewriterson. But I really do encourage you to join the amazing community in our official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. We also have a regular old Facebook page where you can just get straight up info. Support the show at patreon.com slash partners in crime media and you will get exclusive access to the Toby Balls Deep Dive Book Club podcast and Laura Bricker's Rage Walking True Crime Fitness Fun Now Psychological Support Group. Our theme song was performed by the New York Sky Jazz Ensemble and used with permission, and this show was recorded in the yoga loft above the bodega in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi studio, otherwise known as Studio C, the closet in our basement that's actually our own little lover's lane. On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. Payne Lindsay's in this podcast for three minutes, and you shit over all three of those minutes. I don't care. They're terrible. That's B R O O K L I E. I N. Yeah, fuck, I did that. How can you how can I do that wrong? That's B O. No. That's. <laughs> wow, you really. B O. That's B O. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
That's B R O O K L I N E N dot com. Promo code Crime Brooklyn. No, that's not the promo code. <laughs> Oh, shit. I need that simple context. Save big money on Clearview Cabinetry. Clearview Cabinetry starts as a kitchen built for now and grows with you as life changes. It's flexible by design with full access cabinet construction. So you can go from doors to drawers for storage that works when you need it. Explore Clearview's cabinet options in store and on Menards.com and save big money today. Big buys, big savings. Check out more of our great deals going on now at Menards. Save big money at Menards.